The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. Why would a person point a finger at somebody else, knowing that that somebody else cannot do anything in your life? They have no power in your life. Let your Father give that person power in your life. You're not going to have a situation unless God give something power to impede upon your life. It's just not going to happen. But see, that's not what they're teaching people. These subtleties are teaching people that there is happenstance. That's what they teach people. You know, that things just happen. That, uh, you know, it, we got to find out scientifically what's causing it and rid ourselves of the problem. What is that called? That's called taking control realms, certainly realms that man has no control over. They're trying to control the outcome of situations. They're trying to calculate their way all the way up to heaven. It's the Tower of Babel again. It's that same tower again. Man is attempting to be his own God in the earth. Can you all see that? That's why they keep pointing fingers. That's why they come up with solutions the way they come up with solutions. They're doing exactly what God said they would do in both the Old and New Testament. That they would do this. That they would seek to rid themselves of any external power that had any influence over them. That they would control all aspects of their being, all aspects of their lives and their future. This is what they're doing because they truly believe. Now, for a person, if I wanted to take control, listen to this. Now, this might stop on your toes, but let me go ahead and say it. If I wanted to take absolute control over my entire life, that means I trust and no one else with it. That's what it means. If I want to take control over every aspect of my life, I do not trust anybody else over my life. You know how many Christians are caught in that trap? Every aspect of their lives, if they can't control it, they're angry at it. Yes, I'm talking about Christians, people who believe in Christ who are filled up with anger. Why? Because things are not going their way. If they always have someone to blame. When you always have someone to blame, you're the one that's attempting to control everything. If you have no one to blame, you're a person of great responsibility, spiritual responsibility. That's what it means. Because when you don't blame a soul, you understand that your father is constantly working in your life. And if you have a mindset to believe that God is absolutely working in your life every single day, then you understand that things take place for His purpose, which is your victory. Some people don't understand that. But everything God does, isn't He doing that for our victory, for our freedom, for our true liberty? There are scriptures in the Bible that tell us things about our freedom. One, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So if the Spirit of the Lord is with you, you should have true freedom. You shouldn't be bound by any means. How can God make his... his if, if God watches over his word of performance, how can he make that one true in your life? Well, that's easy. That means you every time you control your own situation. You're going to find yourself in bondage. God's going to show you the truth of what you're doing to your life and you're not going to like it. Until one day, you say, I can let go of this. And when you let go, the Lord begins to handle that area. Then the weights come off of your shoulders. That process continues until one day you, you have the weight of nothing on your shoulders. You feel like a feather. Your face is not grumpy. All those frown lines are starting to go away. And you find true liberty on the inside. You start teaching other people, hey, joy can still be had in this world. That's when you become positive, not negative. That's when you understand there is darkness. Yes, there is darkness. But the Lord has put within us to overcome all darkness. We just have to trust the Lord's path for our life more than our own. The world teaches you to take the reins of life and force it to do your will. That's not what your father teaches. Your father teaches responsibility. It's a big difference. Forcing your life to be something and then being a good steward or having responsibility over things in your life, those are two different things. Your children are the most high. That's who you are. But here's a question. Just like kids are built up to be certain people in society through their upbringings by certain families their exposure to video games media movies books literature the educational system is forging who they will be in the future what are you allowing to give you your identity is it the world or is it your father some christians they don't know how to fight anymore that's why they're overtaken emotionally and compromised like that because they don't know how to fight they backed away they have allowed fear to redirect their path it's time to have that corrected. Not by me, but by the Word. See, we can do that collectively. Collectively, we can see what the Father said collectively. Something that is effective, that's healing. Oh, by the way, you know what the Lord said? When you walk behind Him, 
When you truly do walk behind him, when you're submitted to him, there is nothing withheld from you. So you know what that means? That means you're healing. The brokenness some of us experience can never be resolved so long as we're on the wrong path. But everything that we require is right behind Jesus Christ as we follow him. To follow the Lord, to eat is not following him. That's not what that is. Let me give you guys an example of if a child has cookies in his hand, he's walking through the woods, and a wolf is to his left and to his right because they smell the cookies. What is that wolf doing? What are those wolves doing? They're stalking, aren't they? They're looking for something to eat, and so they stalk their prey to get what's left over, potentially to get it. Well, again, we don't stalk the Lord. The Lord said, come follow me, not stalk me. So we're not following him to pick up the breadcrumbs he's dropping. Even though there are scriptures in the Bible that explain a very needy situation. It's actually a, a, a scripture blessing, but that's not what we are. We're, we're sent here to follow Jesus, not to stalk him, not to continually watch him to see what we can get out of him. Nope, that's not following Christ. That's stalking Christ. That's not what we're doing. We are to follow him. So if a crumb falls, we're still following him. He just dropped a crumb. Well, we will too. Then those who only know how to stalk may eat. How about that? But you're not here to eat breadcrumbs. I think you've gone beyond that part. Jesus told those people, he said, listen, you're following me because I've fed you. But he told them, my meat is to do the will of God. So in other words, he said, you're doing what you're doing. You're following me because I've fed your bellies. Because you saw this miracle and you benefited from that miracle. That's why you follow me. But Jesus said, I'm following my father because it feeds me to do the will of the living God. And that, that's so powerful to me. That's very powerful to me. Because people are taught to have folks in their lives that are beneficial to them, of which I do personally stand against all. I, I will not be around a person to feed off their influence like a leech, like a tick. Not doing that. To feed off somebody's influence. You know how the world will say, well, you got to surround yourself with successful people. Wrong. Isaiah was not surrounded by successful people. Jeremiah was not surrounded by successful people. Ezekiel was not surrounded by successful people. Were they? The disciples were not surrounded by successful people. See how that worldly philosophy has invaded our very lives. And sometimes we can't identify it. And so we start getting back to the foundations of which we were sent here in the first place. Those original foundations of faith that we understood from the beginning. You see how that works? And surely, if you can comprehend that, then you know we're at a dividing line in this age. Some people will not break away and some people will. There will be a remnant, which means not the big number you thought, but a remnant. I believe the word of God. When it talks about a remnant, that's a crumb of what used to exist. But I have a hope that any and all can be a part of that remnant. See, we don't truly know how big that remnant is. Listen to this. Of all the people who ever existed, how big is that remnant? Think about that. If a remnant is a fingerprint of something that existed, how big is that remnant? I don't believe that's a, that's a size like we size things. I don't believe the remnant is called a remnant because of what we, of how we measure things. I don't believe that at all. I believe it's put in the context of truth. You know what the context of truth is? The context of truth is inclusive all, not some. Remember that. The truth is not governed by one age, but the truth has been the truth since the beginning of time. So the truth is inclusive all time, not a small season. And all too often we look at things from a seasonal point of view. Well, that's not true. Genetically, you have a lineage. You have a lineage in your flesh. Now, it just said the worst enemy I ever met was my own flesh. I said, I'm the worst guy I know. You're not going to be worse than the person in me. I can point at no other. Jeffrey Dahmer was a lamb compared to me. How about that? My flesh, the old man. I'm not that old man no more. It's not who I am. And it doesn't matter, right? See, t here, here's me. If a person murders a person, right? That's pretty bad. If another person murders a dog, that's murder. It's still murder. So a murderer is a murderer, correct? Now, if a thief stole a piece of candy and another thief robbed an entire bank, a thief is a thief, correct? If I stomped on a bug because I wanted to stomp on a bug, that's murder. Seems trivial. Kind of, that's what, that's what you think. It sounds trivial until that type of attitude stays within you. And then you kill a dog for just killing a dog. You go out hunting just to destroy. That's murder. 
Because God created all things for a purpose. Who am I to go out there and just kill something just to hone and sharpen my skills? That's murder. Now, don't feel bad, hunters. If, if you're a hunter out there, then you're a hunter. Hopefully you hunt out of necessity to keep that skill set. It's a very important skill set. And in order for us to eat, something has to die. It is it is not attractive, but that's the way it is. But to just kill something just to kill it, I knew guys like that on the battlefield. They were in love with killing. Murderers. That's what they were. That's not patriotic. That's a murderer. That's somebody who can who can easily wipe out mankind. All you have to do is give mankind a title, and then somebody else will agree to wipe them all out. That's murder. So anyway, these things are in the flesh. Here's what you may not know. Genetically, you struggle with things of your people who came before you. Their genetics, let's call that a generational curse. Their genetics, all these evil things that they housed in their flesh, you now deal with. Your flesh is not broken, which is why you have to die to your flesh daily. If the flesh could be broken, we would not have to die to the flesh daily. If the flesh could be broken, the spirit and the flesh would not war against each other all the time. The flesh cannot be broken. It's bound to the earth. It can go no further than the earth. So your container is bad unless you subdue it. How about that? Does that make sense? And some of the cravings that you get within yourselves come from your own bloodline. Now, you may not know what your bloodline is, and it's all mixed up today. The bloodlines of today are so mixed up, it's people don't know who they are. But a lot of people struggle with that. They, they struggle with these ideologies. They struggle with things that, that are in them. They don't understand why they have a craving for this thing, why they have a craving for that thing. It's kind of like the nations, especially since the time of nation. Uh, with a, Who was it? J-Path and Shem and Ham. Ham, a lot of nations came from Ham. From Ham came Babylon. That was Babylon came in the time of Akkad, the Akkadian kingdom. Uh, Nineveh was in that same group. In fact, Babylon, Nineveh, the Akkadian uh, culture and all these cultures, were to, they have the same teachings. They also have the same murders. It's, it's so it's strange. They have the same crimes against them, you could say. And from that, that gave birth to uh, Rizin and Kala and uh, Reboth. All these, all these, that was all from him. Uh, Shem, he had, what did he have? He had the, some of those opposing kingdoms. Uh, Meshach, Gether, Uz, Hall, all these uh, different kingdoms came from him. Now, but each one of these individuals gave birth to a nation. The nation was comprised of people who had a certain attitude about things. You may not know this today, but if you're familiar with the cultures of these kingdoms and their, the, the lineage of cultures, the same appetite these cultures had, people have in them today and they don't even understand it. You may not understand why a specific thing gets on your nerves, but it's not from your spirit. When something gets to you and it causes you to be emotionally compromised, it's coming from the flesh. It's coming from one of these kingdoms. It's coming from your bloodline of the flesh, which is why it's very important that you, the spirit, what I'm talking to right now, you, the spirit, you be in control of your container because your container has an appetite. You cannot do anything against that appetite except die to that appetite. You have to die to that appetite. I, I, I have a, this is going to sound strange, but there was a racist individual, well, a few racist individuals that I, I have talked to. I've talked to racists of just about every single culture, and I've talked to these guys. In them, some are taught racism, some are not taught racism. Some actually feel that they're being unjustly shoved aside. Now, at their core, at, at, at the core of some of these people, by way of the flesh, they have an appetite to survive. It's, it's like this strong, instinctive thing in their flesh where they want to survive. And so they're pointing a finger at everything that would ever go against them. Right, anger is always a part of it. It is, it is. But not the anger that's expressed by those who become mouthpieces. Those who become mouthpieces are doing what they do because they believe in somebody else. I'm not talking about those who believe in somebody else who is racist, and therefore they are racist. That's not, I'm talking about the original ones who actually had some sort of philosophy in them. And it's not that they would destroy every race around them. No, that's not what it is. They felt like they were being pushed out. Then you bring this thing down to a common, that, that common itch, right? That common ideology. And it is that in the flesh, the flesh by itself is a survivalist. It does everything it must do to survive. Sometimes that's complicated, sometimes not so complicated. But it does what it does to survive. And you're in your individual lives. You began in this world by attempting to survive. Many of you lied, you stole, you did this, that, and the other to survive. 
Did you notice? But because you're called by God, I can also say something else. You took no joy in the sinful things that you did for real. I'm not talking about going to a party and getting drunk. That's not what I'm talking about. Anytime you sinned against somebody else, you took no pride in it. You did what you did to survive. And for the most part, you guys sin against yourselves more than anybody else. And what I'm saying is, is that when you lied, you lied to cover yourself, right? You did more things against yourself, keeping other people clean of your crimes, basically. But what you did, you did against yourself to survive. It goes back to that common ideology. Now, when you go back to genealogies, some people have this in them so strong that they just committed sabotage of their lives. If not for Christ, we would be given over to the survivalists' genetics of our flesh. This world would tear itself to pieces, which is why the end times, when they finally kick, uh, when they don't want Christ in their knowledge, they don't retain God in their knowledge at any degree. That's why everything is so archaic. Can you see that? Because left unchecked, without you in the way, you may not know this, but you could be the only believer in your community. You can also be the only reason that community has not self-destructed. You may not even know that. You represent something very real. Something of which you feel the conflict of it every single day. That war that goes on inside yourselves. Now, many of you have been stuck stagnant in this war by way of your mind. You know how you sit there in a chair for hours and you say, well, I got to get up and go do this and I got to do that and do that, but I can't move. Anybody ever been there before? That's, that's borderline. If you've been depressed, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But you can win that war. You can absolutely win that war. But it's up to you to push past that barrier. God does not say, son, daughter, you sit right here. I'm going to pour blessings down upon you. You just sit there, and when it comes, you, you do your thing. That's not how it works. God doesn't work that way. We operate by faith. You know what that means? We act on the spiritual truth that is departed to us. You cannot act on anything not departed to you. Lesson number one, we have to start to walk in truth. In our established truth, here's what that means. It doesn't mean you establish your own facts. That's not what it means. That means God has disclosed to you spiritual things you know for a fact. Do not discard those things to try and walk like somebody else. Don't do it. See, that's where a lot of people make a mistake. You may perceive me in a certain light. You may attempt to emulate something of me because you perceived it in a certain light. Don't do that. What you have to do is get up with what God has, has given you clarity of and start walking in that clarity. Somebody asks a good question. This question pops up every so often. They say, well, well, show me how to get up so I can go out and touch many people. God does not work that way. It's never going to work that way. If a person ever says, I need to know how to get up and go out and touch everybody, they've already messed up. That same person, I'm, because I love you, I'm going to say this, the same person, the same people who would ever utter such a thing, they have denied what God has put in front of them, and they're trying to jump over that to get something bigger. Here's what I'm saying. With every call, with all of our collective callings, God qualifies that call within us. Whom he called, he also qualified. Which means if you're truly called to go out there into the world, you're not going to mess everything up because you're going to have pre-qualifications. And what are those pre-qualifications? Well, your sinful life was one of them because you had to meet the devil himself. You had to meet darkness. But the other part is this. Some of you have a heart for other folks. You do. You say, I, I want to go out there and help people. But you will not help those who are right there in your face. And I'll tell you something, until you face that, you're not, you're not going to be given the anointing to go any further. Because God must trust you with the small things first. In fact, one of his principles was this. He will bring, you know, he'll give you these small things to see what you will do with them. If you can be responsible in the small things, faithful in the small things, he'll make you ruler over much. Isn't that one of his principles? But what if he cannot trust us with the small things? For example, some of you have incredible ministries inside of you. And it's not too late. You really do. You have incredible ministries inside of you. But how can God trust you with a bunch of his children out there? He's ready to call to you. If, if you fail to depart the word to the one in front of you, and believe me, that one in front of you, that one that's constantly in your life, the one you're working with, that's impossible. The one where you start speaking this, I want to hear a word you have to say. And then you give up throwing the towel. How can he trust you to go against Satan at a greater level when you can't overcome the devil right in front of your face? You can overcome the devil in front of your in front of your face. But here's how it gets you. A lot of people, when the, when he's right there in front of you, your issue, your circumstance is right there in front of you. Don't jump over it 
right? Don't think to yourself, well, if I just get rid of this, if I'm away from this thing, I'll be free. I can do what I got to do. Nope, nope, nope. Doesn't work that way. Don't even think about going further until you have given this issue all of you. Do you hear what I'm saying? And it will require all of you. You're not going to give it 50% and expect that to be enough. Nope, doesn't work that way. With God, you're going to give 100% or you're just not going to make it. Now, the 100% God put in you is what you're able to do, not what you're not able to do. So each of us have to give 100%, but that 100% for each of us is different. That's the first thing you should know. It may take me more effort or less effort than it takes somebody else. But I am required to give 100% of myself. I'm required to give 100%. And guess what? We all know when we're not giving 100%. But then we let the worst thing happen. When we don't give 100% to that problem, to that issue, to that individual right in front of us, then we allow darkness to step into our hearts and we start blaming that person for holding us back. Get that out of your spirits. Nothing on earth nor in the heavens has power to hold you back from the calling of the living God. God has given nothing power over you like that. So nothing has power to stop you in your calling. Not one thing. That happened once in history, and that was with Christ Jesus. And that was purposed. It happened to no one else. So get that out of your minds. He has given nothing that power over you through him. That's the first thing. So that means you have to be a good steward over what's in front of you. Now I know it'd be so much easier to just skip it over. It would. It'd be so much easier to have that thing out of the way. You say, man, if I could just get that out of the way, I'd be good to go. But that's the problem. That's why it's not going anywhere. Because it requires the truth of you. God puts something in you that's needed in that situation. You're not going to sidestep this one and be trusted with anything else. This is your chance. Never look for it to be this great person in the world. Don't let that be your motivation. Look to make a difference with one, with all of what you are. Yeah, I'm going to be honest with you. You know what I do? I try to give the one person everything I've got. I don't try to give everybody everything I've got. I try to give the one person everything I've got. That's it. That, that's all. I try to help the one person. That's all I try to do. The Lord took over the rest. This is not lit that it, because some of you may not even know this. I'm not one to sit in front of people and talk like this. Matter of fact, I was the same one. Back in 2005, this is talk is so cheap. People talk all the time. They don't do anything. I did not like meetings because all they would do was talk while the people suffer. They sit up there and laugh and drink water and drink other things, making decisions and end up not doing anything while people still suffer. I'm not that person. I'm one of the in the field. I have to have my hands on the situation where I'm not doing anything. Talking is not doing anything. Talking is communicating. I have to do to this day, I have to do things. I have to be on the scene. I have to do, I can, I would never be complacent just sitting here in this chair talking to you guys every single day. But no, I have to get up and do. I have to get up, I have to be in the middle of things to assist. It's like thinking about a person hungry. How could someone just think about another person being hungry and not give up and give that person their all? If I think about somebody being hungry, I'm going to get everything I got left and go give it to the person. How about that? One? I can do that. Do you know why? Because the Lord put me in a position where it's, it's, it's me. It's just me. If you got a family, you can't do that. You have to be true to what the Lord put in you. But I'm truly in the bushes. So there's no telling what I can do. There, there are unpredictable parts of my life. I can give every penny I have away. And if taking care of somebody else, you guys can't do that. You have responsibilities. You can't do that. So, so but my, my life is different. It's been, it's been that way for a long time. It's not something anybody should envy after. Because if you don't have faith, you're just not going to make it. But back to you. The Lord puts specific things in you that you've got to find. How do you find them? When you stop emulating everybody else. Listen, who you are as an individual is what this world needs. The world does not need another person being like me. That is not what the world needs. The world needs you. You, the authentic you. Not the you that they tried to be like somebody else. The world needs you. The world needs what God put in you. That's what the world needs. It does not need, and only you can bring forward what the Lord put in you. Now, do not subscribe to what other people, you know how people say, well, God put this in you, and if you don't use it, it's going to be gone wrong. That's man always in a rush. Man is always in a rush. They're always telling you that if you don't use something, God will take it out and go give it to somebody else. I never read that before in my life. That, that's a bunch of hogwash. I'm an artist. I went 28 years without drawing a thing. So I pick up a pencil again, and I start drawing again where I'm left off. After a day, after one day, right? You know, because you kind of shake it first. After one day, my skills are back. Riding a bike 
How many of you had to be retaught how to ride a bike? Why not? Because when God gives you something, it's not going to go anywhere. It does not leave. Oh, consequently, when God gives you something, you can cover it up with anything you like. You can try to do everything else in the world. I can t- I'm going to tell you something. You're naturally going to do a part of your calling. If you're ever confused about your calling, one of the first notable things about your calling is no one else will agree with it. You tell somebody your calling, and it's your true calling, nobody else around you, that they will not agree with it. They're not. They're going to say, oh, no, no, not you, not you. That's what they'll say. Don't look for a public consensus of the calling you have in your life. Didn't you, you know in the Bible, the, call, the people who were called to do what they were do, not one person agreed with what God had given them to do. Not one person. Isn't that funny? So don't look for a consensus, nor some public agreement to your calling. You know what number two is? You're not going to believe that you're able to do that calling. But here's the kicker. It's something that you naturally do anyway. Your calling is part of you, and you are part of your calling. You can't separate the two, which means you can pick up any other skill set and attempt to use it. It's still, it may not be your calling. You do your calling day in and day out. Jeremiah, before he was the Jeremiah, had a heart for those things of the Father. How do you know this? Look at how they were called and what they told God upon uh, upon meeting with the living God. You remember when Jeremiah said, oh, why did you pick me? I'm not even clean enough to do this. He had honor and respect for the word of God. Do you see that? When, when somebody says, I am filthy, I'm not clean enough to do this, Lord, and they're talking to the living God, they have honor, they have respect for the word. They were communicating they're calling to the living God at the onset, right there when they had that first meeting. Isn't that something? It was part of them. You can't separate the two. And then when God anointed them, he anointed them with the understanding and the wisdom, the knowledge, and the power to go forth to people to give a message to those who wouldn't listen to them. Because what, he, what did they also? Well, they're not going to listen to me because what I have to say does not line up with what they have to say. So they were giving their qualifications. God empowered them to do it. Do you see that? So the calling was always part of them, just like your calling is always part of you, and you are always part of your calling. No one gets tired of their own calling. Everyone lives for that calling God gave them. You can't separate the two. That's why you have to be careful in this day and age. In this day and age, this has to be the age of emulation, where everybody tries to be like somebody else for a reason. In other words, people take on the characteristics of another person for the sake of advantage. And we have to be careful not to do that, not to do things for the sake of advantage. You have to be careful of that. Have you guys noticed that the originality is almost like everything is being regurgitated? The same things over and over again. Have you guys noticed that? The wells are dying. They're dying so much to now people are breaking the gospel down into calculations. That's pretty bad. When you have to make the gospel interesting by breaking it down into calculations of things that a person should already know something is wrong with that, that means they're trying to make it interesting. They're trying to make the gospel interesting by throwing all these extra ingredients in there. Because guess what? Here's the deal. They're not drawing upon fresh water. Fresh water comes from the living God. And when the well goes dry, now we have to remember the word is going gonna, is gonna to be gone from the earth. There will come a day when people can't find the word of God. You're doing that now. If that weren't the case, you wouldn't be here listening to me. What led you to me in the first place? Because you were hunting for something that you couldn't find out there. So here you end up at the back end of the back end. Maybe the Lord set C.O.T. up as the last knit when nothing else works. The last, absolute last resort is part of us or something. But uh, here we are. I'm not exactly in line. I I don't go with the flow of everybody. Have you noticed? I just don't go with the flow because I want the truth. If it's one thing I want, it's the truth. I do not want another story. I want the truth. And when the Lord said we can have the truth, then I'll accept nothing but that. I need that truth. Don't give me a bunch of good-looking stuff that does not work and expect me to live by that. Nope, I want the truth. That's what I want. The truth. Because I have to live in this world. This walk is for real. Even the consequences are for real. You can only dance around the truth for so long before it has to come out. I don't know about you guys, but I want the truth. It also means you have... You can see things that others can't see. You can't explain it. But let me give you a piece of your personality right here. That means when you hear anybody talking about the Word of God, not only do you hear what they're saying, but you can also hear their motive. In a lot of cases, you know why they're saying exactly what they're saying. And then sometimes you've been hopeful. You're like, okay, well, maybe through this sermon, I won't hear that one thing. And you're enjoying the sermon, then all of a sudden you hear it. And you say, well, there it is. 
And we're not talking about money. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a motive. God is giving you the ability to see why a person is saying what they're saying. Don't you find that odd? You know, in, in the average person, what you, you sat there shocked that nobody else could figure that out. That you're looking around like, can they not hear? Can they not see this? No, they can't see it. That's why you were stuck in the middle of it. Of course they can't see it. If they could see it, they would have said something about it. Now, here's, here's the outright, here's the bad part. Because you could see that because God is giving you eyes to see the motive of certain things that you can't really articulate. There's been no one around you to share in that understanding. So you've never had instruction as to what to do about it. Nobody ever gave you instruction on what to do once you identify such a thing. I've heard people say the strangest things. Well, we're supposed to call them out. No, you're not. You're not to call anybody out. That's indignant. That's our father's job. Remember, the father unzips all of us to show everybody exactly what we are. That's not our job. That's God's job. We encourage the good in somebody else. You can see all the evil in another person. We're sent here to encourage the good. God sees the evil. He's going to deal with that. That same evil, we are not to make friends with the evil inside another person, but encourage the good in that person. We, we see the seeds that have been planted in people. We have entered into other men's labors, Jesus said. And so somebody else has planted a seed. We can come along and water that seed. But remember something. It is God that gives the increase. And what that means is somebody may plant a seed. Somebody may talk an initial message with someone. And it may take root. It may take many other people to water that seed. But nothing grows until God gives the increase. When God gives the increase, the soil, the water, it works together. The seed germinates and poof, it grows. God gives the increase. This teaching does not go out enough. And so what people do is they'll say, well, I don't see any growth out of that person. I'm, I'm, I got to go somewhere else. We don't make anything grow. God makes things grow. We may plant a seed. We may come along and water a seed that's been planted. It is God Almighty that gives the increase. He determines when something takes off and when it does not. So just like in a field, a farmer can plant a seed. He's still going to need the elements to align with his planting in order for that thing to grow. You plant the seed and water it, then all of a sudden temperatures drop to 10 degrees. You're not going to have a crop. Somebody else, you, you, but, but God is that season. Do you see what I'm saying? He determines when something takes off, just like in your life. How many people came in your life, in all honesty, how many people came in your life talking about the Word of God? And in first, you even dodged people because you knew they were coming to you to talk about the Word of God. There was a part of you that wanted to hear it. You just didn't want to hear it from that person. And then at certain times, you had to get away from the whole thing because you were thinking about weird stuff. So people did come along in your life and sow seeds. People did come and water seeds. But it was that one moment where probably no one else was around or you heard something said specifically and you received it upon yourself. It was an appointed time. And then everything you had heard and every seed that was planted, it began to do something within you and it grew. God appointed that time. Remember that God appoints the time when the seed and the water and the soil begins to work. God appoints the time when you actually comprehend God appoints that time. We don't do that. A lot of people waste their time waste their time trying to make somebody else understand what they're saying. You can't do that. You can't open up a man's comprehension. You can't do that. But I can assure you of something. There are seeds out there looking for water, and some need the water that you carry. They don't need my formula. They need your formula. They need what God put in you. They don't need what I have in me. And in order for them to get that water, God has already set it up. He already had you born on earth with a certain type of water. So what happens if you're not in position? What happens if you say no? What happens if you keep putting it off? You're going to delay the entirety of the process. And see if you can understand that now you know why that scripture states that God is not slack concerning his promises as men count slackness. But God is long-suffering to us for it. Why? He desires that none of us perish outside of him that all men come to repentance. Well, he's, he's actually expanding this season because of what? Why has this season been expanded so long? Because of us. He's not willing to count us out. While you're trying to have faith in the Most High, obviously, he has faith in you. Now, all of this can be halted. All of these things deal with growth. And it begins in one area. I was talking about the nations and genetics. Because there are elements of your flesh that fight the understanding God has put in you. The understanding that you've had since birth, there's something fighting it. And it's time that that be unlocked. Now, genetically, you're going to have an appetite for what your culture, for what your race, for what your heritage has departed to you. 
Please understand that. In other words, your flesh has an appetite to survive. That appetite came from many of those who came before you in your lineage. You may not know your, the entirety of your lineage. I even know that genetically it goes back to Japheth and Shem and Ham and Noah. It goes back to that. But which appetite do you have? Do you have that Babylonian appetite in your flesh? Do you have that Elam appetite in your flesh? Do you have the Gomer appetite in your flesh? What is it? Sometimes we can't identify the appetite within us. Which means you have an appetite that's been in your flesh from the beginning, passed down through from generation to generation to generation. And your flesh is going to get irritated. Your flesh is full of emotion. Your flesh is full of thoughts. Your flesh is full of everything it needs to survive. Please understand that. It's the very thing you do not allow to run your life. You don't allow your carnal mind to run your life. Your carnal mind says that thief that's in jail is guilty. Your spiritual mind can only be the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ is to set the captive free. To give that person an opportunity to repent of the wrongs they have done in their lives. That the cross be for them also. So while uh, your flesh would say that person is locked up there out of the way. Leave that person alone. Your spiritual side would say go to that person and see if that person knows who Christ Jesus is. See the difference? The spirit, the flesh do war against one another. Always. Your spirit's going to operate in the realm of truth. It'll be fed by truth and the will of God. Your flesh is going to operate in the realm of man. It's going to be just like an animal. It will seek to survive. It even has instincts. Instinctual knowledge passed down from generation to generation. If you act on your flesh, you're acting on that animal in the earth, which will kill something to free itself, which will maim something to free itself. Your flesh will always leave a trail of casualties. Your spirit, a trail of blessings. In the Bible, it teaches us to die to the flesh daily. You know what that is? That is not to act on these things of the flesh every single day. So you have to start there. But you'll have no power over your flesh unless you do one thing. It, it starts here. Your flesh has accused people in your life. Your flesh is the one that points fingers at everybody. Now listen to me. This is very important. I know you have someone in your life you blame. You don't need to name that person here. You don't need to corroborate what I'm saying. But there's someone in your life that you blame that sent your life off course. I know you have that person in your life. That person was never the cause of your problem. That person put into your life. You know that person is screaming out for help and they don't know how to receive it. That person is not a person who should ever be a target of your blame. You don't have to be around the person or anything else, but you must forgive that person. When your life goes off the rails like these trains, now you watch those, all these derailments that we have, although I believe part of that is sabotage through neglect of maintenance and other reasons. I believe it's going to reflect upon the nature of things that are coming right now. Many things are going to be derailed. Many plans are not going to work out right. Confusion is really about to settle itself into many different, many people's hearts spiritually. In fact, I believe that everything we see in the natural will equate to some sort. It gives a foreshadowing of some sort of spiritual declaration that always takes place. If we would only pay attention and realize our father is a father of purpose, especially when it comes to you. Satan would have you blame someone because so long as you blame a person, you're not fighting the true cause of your issue. You blame a person. You're doing the opposite of what God said to do, and you're not in the fight. Your attacks are supernatural, coordinated. Never, ever forget that. Start looking beyond the person into the causes that made that person do that. What spirit is operating that's trying to get to you? By the way, that's a blessing. If a spirit is trying to get to you, that's a blessing. If Satan already had you, there'd be no need for him to assault you. He will often try to get to you to stop you from getting around other people. He'll also go to other people to stop them from listening to you. It's time to set that straight. This begins in the realm of forgiveness. Now listen to me. When you forgive, forgive is not to simply sit there and say, well, I forgive that person. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is of your spirit. Can the flesh forgive someone? No. The flesh will do everything for itself. If we die to our flesh daily, your flesh is not going to account too much for righteousness. But you, the spirit, are to have dominion over your flesh, first and foremost. So when your flesh seeks to accuse someone by way of your carnal mind, you've got to put it down. That's when you put things in perspective. The same one you're putting down by way of your mind, no matter what they have done, the same one you remember that Jesus died for them too. 
that your flesh may say, well, they reject the cross because they keep doing what they're doing. And then that's when you come to that realization. Well, guess what? When I knew about Christ, I still did wrong. So in a way, I rejected him too. But thank God he forgave me over and over and over again. So you had to be truthful. When you do this, you know what happens? When you start forgiving, I'll say this. Satan cannot, he cannot operate within an environment of forgiveness and unconditional love. He cannot operate in that environment. He can't do it. Where you stand forgive, there is no accusation. If you even stand ready to forgive someone because of your unconditional love, he can't accuse. His accusations won't stick and you will dethrone him from your life. When you do this, your situation begins to change immediately. Hope you know that. I've learned something in my life that when your situation changes abruptly, Satan was surely behind it. When you start to forgive everybody in your life, you see, to do that means you're about to move on. You are not to be in the earth. Just a side note, you're not to be in the earth powerless, where you can't heal anybody, where you're around those who don't even believe in that anymore. You're not to be that person. That's not to be you. But you've got to dethrone Satan. He's already been booted out of heaven. He can't accuse anybody because of Christ. Accusations do not work in the presence of the Lamb. Because of the cross, he cannot accuse you. Well, guess what? You need to establish that in your homes. Kick him right out of your environment by saying, no, no, Christ died for the very ones you would dare accuse of anything. See, that's when you have the gospel on your mind. So forgiveness is key. Nothing will unlock itself unless you forgive. Because the Bible is clear. If you don't forgive, your Father in heaven will not forgive you. And how many people have gone years and they have not forgiven certain people in their lives? I'll tell you right now, God has not forgiven them of one thing. Everything they have done is on their heads. He does not want you to die in that state. Because if you fail to forgive, you deny the cross in view of men. And Jesus said, if you do that, he'll deny, he'll deny you in view of the angels. And I hope you know that's connected to judgment. And you will not make it. You will not step foot to the kingdom of God. Well, see, that's bad. Because if you will not step foot into the kingdom of God, you can't exercise the power of the kingdom here on this earth. And you're powerless. Do you see that? So if you fail to forgive, you're going to have mishap after mishap after mishap. And how many people are tired of mishaps? You know, when you got something figured out, then all of a sudden you get your you get your finances figured out. You say, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm level now. I can do this. And somebody goes to the hospital. Another bill. You get that taken care of, and then something happens somewhere else. And it always happens that way. How many people, you have issues like that in your life? I would say a lot have those issues. Because God made a declaration. He said it would be as though you put your money in your purse, but it's a hole in your purse. In other words, wherever you're putting that money, a situation will always form to take that money from you. And you guys know that as soon as you get where you need to be, something always happens to take what you have. If you want that situation gone, you've got to not align yourself with those who are living in that cursed way of life. Don't live in that cursed way of life. I can absolutely tell you right now, I know you guys don't understand. Most people don't even know what my finances are. But I'll tell you this, I'm living by faith 100%. Do you know that? That's a fact. I said, nothing is guaranteed to me. My life is not how it used to be. But I'm called upon often. How, how would you like to be called upon, right? You're not getting, listen, you're, you're, you're being called upon. And then let's see, after you're called upon, maybe eight months later, you might, you'll see a check from that. How would you like that? How would you like to forego your own retirement? You know, I had to get rid of my retirement. I did. I'm dead serious about my walk with the Lord. And retirement was not part of that. Because I would have to operate under terms of which they said I can't do that. You didn't know that, did you? Yeah, that means I don't have retirement. I surrendered my own retirement. You guys don't have to do that. I'm called a very different way. What I'm doing, I'm doing for real. It may not be real to everybody, but it's real to me. I'm in it 100%. Faith is everything to me. And I live by faith. Without the Lord, I would not survive. But I don't think about survival ever. Do you know that? Sometimes, because things are not like they used to be. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not making 22 grand a month, right? That's not what I'm making. Can you imagine making $22,000 a month? You don't have too much to deal with, right? You know, everything has changed since then. And I'm still on call by the same people who severed retirement, severed this and severed that. Now when they need you, no other choice but to call upon you. Isn't that funny? That's funny. That's real funny because that doesn't happen. They've already tried. Well, and they've tried so many tricks. It's just not working. But I know why the Lord did what he did. 
I know I operate by convictions for real. I know the penalties involved in such things. The greater penalty to me would be to not operate by what I believe is true. You guys understand that? I have to operate based on those convictions I really have. I will not sit here and profess something to anybody, and I don't believe it myself. You better believe if I profess something, it's absolutely real to me. Because people have no idea what season they're in. Many of you, you're, you're smart, but you may not have a clue as to what season you're actually in. You may not know what's around the corner. You don't know that. And I know that people are not going to get themselves prepared. I know they're not. So I am. Folks, I want you to think about something. A time will come when communications, people are going to have communications, but you will not be permitted on their networks. That has to be circumvented. Everything you know is going to change. And so here in this place, see, I want the real word, not some mythical word. I want the real word, not a mythical word. I cannot do the mythical word. People who have a mythical word are grumpy. God did not say that his children would be grumpy during the end of days. That's not what he said. Sometimes they would be a little frightened. But he told us to stay the course, to have no fear. He said, lift up your heads. He said, look up and lift up your heads. When you begin to see these things, look up and lift up your hands. That means you're not walking with your head down. You're walking differently than everybody else. You're walking with hope, not in defeat. Well, the only way that's going to be real to you is if you act upon your real faith. If you have a backup plan, how then are you walking by faith? See, with me, Liz, it's all or nothing. If faith fails, I am doomed. Do you know that? Because I believe in my Lord that way. I do not have a backup plan. Hope you guys get that, right? Because I'm telling you something. God has designated you to walk much stronger than I. I'm starting a fire. I know some of you will take this. You'll take it and do so much more with it. But if you don't get the principles laid out, you're going to be stuck where you are. Now, I don't want to see you stuck, but you live in a time of demonstration. So we have to do a complete work here. But your first step is forgiveness, real forgiveness. When you have forgiven someone, you know when you forgave them. You know how you know? Because you'll start to wonder if they're okay. That's when you know you've forgiven someone. Instead of pointing your finger at them, instead of anger overtaking you in their presence, you'll say, Lord, please extend mercy upon them. See, there are certain people I know I can't do anything for because they were that person in my life. And I, I can't really do anything for them because Satan still has them. Do you not know I pray for them every single day? I pray for them that God extend them mercy as he extended me mercy. And do you know what is working? Not because I'm praying, but the Lord is allowing me to see a transition in these people's lives. So long as Satan can utilize a person to cause you to react in a negative light, he's going to continue to use that tactic. The moment he gets in a person and confronts you and says a phrase that would normally light you on fire and it does not, states a fact that would normally light you on fire and it does not, as soon as his weapons cease to work, he'll not use those tactics anymore. Do you know that? Many of you have the same complaint. You'll say, this person always comes around and they always seem to say something that really gets to me and then I get him raised. That's why I can't be around the person. No, you keep falling prey. You keep falling victim to the same weapon. Or you're victimizing yourself. You're not really a victim. But Satan will continue to use the same weapon as long as it works. And when you mumble to yourself and talk out loud, you're telling the spiritual realm everything about yourselves. Satan does not have to read your mind. We communicate too much. We react too much. He knows how you react. He knows when something gets to you. You are giving him ammunition against you, right? And so long as Satan can operate within a person and give them a phrase that really gets on your nerves, he's going to continue to do it over and over again. You're going to put a halt to it. You have to start telling your flesh, no, I'll not point a finger at this person. I will not target a person. Don't allow your flesh to target anyone, lest they be a target of your prayers and your heart. If Satan can keep that cycle going, not only will he keep it going, he'll cause that cycle to expand to more and more people. And before you know it, you're going to have lots of targets. This is a season to get that off of your life. Somebody says, you say you pray in silence. I do a lot. I, you know what? In the average course of my day, this call me. You can call me what you want to call me, but before I do anything, I normally consult with the Lord because I don't want to do anything that's a waste of time. In that consultation with the Lord, when I'm just thinking about the Lord and those things, He brings Scripture to my every single time. It's a Scripture. It's not no booming voice from the sky. None of that, but a Scripture. I'll go in there and I'll look at the Scripture out of curiosity. 
but it answers the, the underlying question. In other words, he'll answer a question I did not ask him by way of my own thoughts, but he'll answer the underlying issue before I ever get started, and that truly amazes me. And no one on earth can tell me that is not the Father, because I don't speak, I, I do not voice things. I just don't voice things. If I'm not talking on air, many people have never heard me speak, do you know that? Because I'm not one who goes out and just talks to people. There has to be a purpose behind my communication. But in prayer, I want you to think about something. God gave us vocal cords for each other. You can't read my mind. I can't read yours either. And so we communicate through our voice just like animals do. But when it comes to our spirits, when you're dreaming and praising the Lord, or you're dreaming and rebuking Satan, you're not speaking, you're not using your vocal cords. That's not what you're doing. Even in the Bible, it says that there are moans and groans, that, that nothing in the tangible realm, so to speak, can understand. But that is your spirit communicating directly to the living God. See how that works? So God understands your intent. If he can discern the intents and the thoughts of the, your heart, your mind, he does not require your mouth. When I'm, I'm speaking to you, when I speak to you guys, or pray out loud. If I pray out loud, it's so that other people can hear what I'm praying. Should they agree, they can join with me with that prayer. When I'm by myself, I'm very silent always. And that, I know that's contrary to what a lot of people believe, but God purposed, he purposed everything. God does not require the body to communicate with us. When he brought people up by the spirit into the heavens, they weren't in the flesh when they went there. They were in the spirit. I, I, I will never equate the living God to a human being where he requires the same things we do. That's just like, I do not need to repeat anything to the living God. He does not have a hearing aid. He heard it the first time. The problem is, sometimes when you state something, you don't really mean it. But if you mean something, you don't need to say it again. That's why in the Bible it says the Lord has, the, the Lord knows what you have need of before you ask him. He already knows. That's why I don't, I, you know what, I've, I've not ever prayed for myself. I don't pray for myself saying, Lord, I need so and so and I need this. Because I trust the Lord to give me, according to his raising of me, what I need. So I never, I pray for you guys. I pray for other folks. I don't need to pray for myself because the Lord has, he already knows what I need. So why would I tell him again? I believe he already knows. So I don't, I don't do that, but I will pray for other people. Again, when I use my voice is so that other people can hear what I'm praying about. Or there have been occasions I was scared to death when I confronted certain things and I was really loud then. That was in my early days out of fear. I was super loud, praying out loud because I was scared to death. That's, that's the truth. Other than that, it's a lot of silence. It really is. But folks, again, what happens when you forgive and you release other people? You know what happens? Do you know what happens when you actually forgive and you release other people? Not only are you obedient, but there are no repercussions to, the, to your own deeds in this earth. See, a lot of people, they sow things that they have forgotten about because they fail to forgive. And if they fail to forgive, then their father has not forgiven them. And if he did not forgive you, you're going to reap what you sow. The truth is, if we were to reap everything we sowed, we'd be dead. If you forgive, then you're actually upholding the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in honor of his gospel. He has already established. That's called obedience. And once you, when you, when you are obedient to the Lord, you're automatically under his blessing, not under his curses. In Isaiah, we know that the earth is cursed because of people's iniquity. We know that those who practice iniquity are already cursed. Right? You don't want to be under that curse. You don't want to be the one where you're, you're, everything escapes you, where you're barely making it. They say, you don't want to be one of those individuals. You don't want to be that. It starts with forgiveness. Because if you don't forgive, everything else you do is, is void. It doesn't mean anything. It's, it's going to be powerless. God cannot truly bless you. He can have mercy on you. He has mercy on all of us. But how can he bless you if you deny his son's cross? to somebody else. Because if we don't forgive someone, what we're actually saying is the cross should not be for them. If we don't have a heart to forgive someone, then we're denying the cross for that person. Then we're saying the sin outweighs the sacrifice of Christ. They don't deserve it. That's what we're saying. To deny the cross for somebody else is to have denied it for yourself and you're in danger. And Satan would just love for you to continue not forgiving people, trying to make your life seem like you're going to make it anyway. Don't fall for that. Because when the dangers come, you don't want the mercy you have sown to be revoked. And you have to reap the death you have hoped upon somebody else. To deny the cross in somebody's life is to be complicit with that person's death. Don't let that be you. A lot of people ask, well, what do I need to, to protect my family? You're going to need the Lord's hand over your family. 
But if you fail to forgive denying the cross in somebody else's life, and you really do agree that they deserve death, death will come for you. The very thing you hope on another, you will have yourselves. Let no one tell you that it takes a long time to forgive someone. That's a lie. Forgiveness is a decision of the heart. That's what forgiveness is. What initializes forgiveness is to drop your accusations. You can't allow Satan to target a person, to have you target a person, make them responsible for anything that you think failed in your life. Because if you're a Christian, you have no failures in your life. Everything that took place was purposed. So by you pointing to somebody else saying they're the reason you did not get this or that, you're lying to yourself. You're also saying they've stopped the work of God. No one has power to do that. You know who has power to stop the work of God in my life? Me. Nobody else has that power. You, the same thing. You have power to stop the work of God in your own life. You don't have power to stop the work of God in somebody else's life. It's like um, a lot of people, they hear that scripture and the, there's life and death and the power of the tongue, right? I'm paraphrasing. But that person's life or death, you don't have the power in your tongue to speak life or death into me. Only my father can do that. You don't have that. Now, if I speak death in somebody else's life, I just killed myself. Someone says, what initializes forgiveness is to drop the accusations. That's right. Listen, because Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And that's one thing you're going to have to rid your whole life of. It's, it, it doesn't matter what the accusation is. You're going to have to drop all accusations. Anything that will cause you to target another person, you're going to have to drop it. That is not your father's way. That's not your father's way. And you begin right there. Right there is where you begin. That's where it starts. When you truly take a step to do this, I'm telling you, your life is going to begin to change. Now, let me give you a warning so that you understand. And the warning is this. Darkness does not like to give up its real estate. Someone is going to give, talk to you about forgiveness and how you should not forgive how somebody deserves something. Hope you're listening to me. They don't even know about this conversation I'm having with you, but they're going to come to you and tell you that that person that you're blaming, they deserve it. They're going to encourage you to continue to blame the person. You better realize that's not your father's way. That's how Satan works. He will always challenge the principles of the Lord in this world. One of the biggest acts of obedience is for you to forgive all. And once you have forgiven all, once you have stopped accusing, once you have forgiven all, then I want you to do something. After you have forgiven all, go to the Lord and ask the Lord to forgive you of all. You can ask it right now because you did not forgive everybody else. Once you forgive your enemies, once you forgive those who Satan has spoke to you to accuse, once you have forgiven them, go to your father and say, Lord, forgive me. Have a good sit down with him. If you have to recall everything you did in your life, so be it. But ask him for forgiveness and receive that forgiveness. He'll help you out in that department. See, this is something you can't articulate by words. This is something you're going to have to experience. Because I can tell you right now, it's not going to be an average prayer, an average session, where you just say, Lord, forgive me, and then you walk off. That's not what it's going to be. Do this wholeheartedly. Get out from underneath that curse that keeps robbing you. A curse will also rob your health. Do you know that? In the Bible, it says, the Lord says, I'm with thee, you prosper as your soul prospers. Well, what happens if your soul is not so prosperous? You won't be either. The Lord does desire us to be complete. But why would he want me to be complete if all I'm going to do with my completeness and wholeness is blame other people? Why would he want me to be whole if all I'm going to do is the devil's work in the earth by accusing the brethren? See, we have to get away from the works of darkness completely. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Don't adopt his ways and let no one talk you into accusing anyone. I don't know about you, but I want this. Therefore, people an enemy. I do not see them as an enemy. I have an adversary, the devil. The devil and Satan is my adversary, but another person is not my enemy. They will not be because Satan will never use me to target anyone. All of us get frustrated with people, but I will never have it in my heart to deny the cross on anyone's wrongdoings. So long as a person has breath, who do you think allows them to live in that very day? Do you know that God gave man a chance even through that, even through the millennial reign? He gave them a chance to repent, and they wouldn't. All throughout Revelation, you read how they would not repent of the works. For everything that happened, they wouldn't repent. All they had to do was repent. And certainly in the dreams I had when I was a child, I still remember that woman blaming every situation and everything on her circumstances. And in that moment, I knew why we were here on this earth. 
I can't even fully articulate it now, but I knew that she was just wasting her time blaming people. That's not what her life was about. That's not what life was about. This is a narrative that Satan has put in the minds of people to distract them from what the Lord has for them. It's like living your life after some movie that Hollywood wrote. God defined why you're here. It's time that people find the reasoning for that by the Lord's word, not by what they heard through the grapevine. Your life holds great meaning. Don't allow Satan to cause you to throw that away. God put meaning in your life. You're not some accident. You're highly purposed. That's why we should resist the devil, not entertain him, but resist him. You can only resist the devil one way. That's my opposition. When he says accuse, you shout forgiveness. When he says blame, you release. When he gives you an accusation, cast that accusation down to the ground and speak about the cross. We can all accuse each other of all sorts of things, but by way of the cross, no accusation shall stand against us. The Lord made the way, and he finished what needed to be finished. Satan is the one trying to make us void that. And if he can use us as a vessel avoiding that, he can destroy us first. That's what he seeks to do. It's time for that to stop before the true horrors come upon the earth. You won't see horrors like the next guy. You don't even know that, do you? Your vision will be different. The way you perceive things will be different. But the world is going to be horrified. It's just like now. People are horrified over things right now. And sometimes you look at them like, why are they horrified over that? That's what happens when the Lord brings you to greater and greater mature levels. What horrifies your flesh? Well, it just has no bearing on you. It didn't make a difference in your life. It doesn't move you. And you are not to be moved by these things that are coming upon the earth. But you're moved by one thing. You know what that is? The Holy Spirit. God's truth. And the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not by all this other stuff. So to understand the process of what's happening upon the earth, that's good and fine. But if you stand ready to be consumed by those very disasters that come, that's not a good position to be in. And that's what Satan wants. He wants you to curse God and die. How would a person curse God and die? When they believe that God has abandoned them. That's how. I don't know if you've noticed. A lot of the youth, when it comes down to it, they keep telling their parents, I just want to be happy. They keep saying that one phrase. They want to do their iniquitous thing. They want to continue to be, you know, not get married, but just have boyfriends and girlfriends and all sorts of things. And then if the parent should ever say something, the child will say, can't you just let me be happy? Something is speaking through them. My God, this generation needs a wake-up call. The Lord knows they need a wake-up call. And that wake-up call is coming, but it will take some disastrous things to get them to pay attention. They are stubborn, but what's coming will break right through that stubbornness. That's your time to work. See, because when the real things happen, everybody's going to run back to the gospel, and that's going to be the time they're not going to be able to find it. They're going to need that gospel. They're going to need the sayings of Jesus. They're going to need some of the foundational speeches. Right before their eyes, they're going to see all the mystical things they ever thought of, plus some. It's going to be hard to deal in this reality. It's going to be nothing like people have so fastly foretold it to be. When things begin to manifest on the earth, when the truth of things is known for what they are, it's going to scare people badly, many to the point of death. People won't be the same. And you're at that door. You're not talking about something that's going to come when humanity's ready for it. No. If something like that were to form, it'd form at a time like mm, right now. What would happen, honestly, if an entire culture came out of the sea? If about six billion things came out of the sea? What would happen? What do you think people would do? First, they say, I can't believe it, until the inevitable took place. We're not talking about some invasion either. No. Something you will be able to see with your human eyes, but something you'll perceive spiritually at the same time. Something that will cause your flesh to, to go very cold. What would people do? All their plans would be out of the window, wouldn't it? People are not ready for anything like that. First of all, people don't... When you start talking about certain things like that, people say, well, I don't see how that can happen. We just keep living. Because you're in the moment now. You're in the season now. I, I notice people keep talking about... One thing I'm going to have to clarify is you hear a lot of people talking about Nibiru or binary system. What they have forgotten is life forms come back on that system to this one. They've forgotten about that one. Like locusts. What about gates? You guys heard about little movies like Stargates and things. Do you know Stargate was made after something very real? But it does not look anything like the movie Stargate. It doesn't even operate like that thing, Stargate. But something like locusts are going to pour out of it. And that's no joke. See, are people ready for that? 
Because that's almost like, it'll kind of be like sci-fi is coming to fruition. There are things in the earth right now that if a person could see them, they would pray every day that they never wake up. There are things so bad that you can see with your eye that you'll ask the Father to destroy you and your family after seeing it. People have done that. There are truths out there so terrible. You'd go insane after hearing it. There's no way you could live a normal life again. And once you're no longer innocent concerning things, there's no going back. Your father has been very protective over you. Certain things you have not been exposed to because you're not ready to be exposed to them. What the world will soon face, they will not be able to handle. They will not be able to fight. They will lose big time. And you are not to be in the final throes of that battle. Because man cannot see it, it's not inclusive with their end of time paradigm because they haven't seen it. For those who have, they have no idea how to tell a soul. That's how bad it is. You just can't run up and tell somebody anything like that. But the sad part is you know they're going to encounter it. And in those days, you're going to find out who people actually are. All the stops are going to be pulled down at that point. And those who will seek to survive will do everything to survive. Those who truly love the Lord will bow to the Lord during those days. They will depend upon Him. But the truth of humanity will be known for what they really are. We have time to prepare for before those days. A little time, anyway. Oh, need I remind you before I go that uh, you already knew things would be different when you got older. You already knew that. Nobody had to tell you that. You're just looking now. You're looking to see exactly when that's going to take place. Let me be. Uh, let me give you some advice. Understand that right now, many things are in operation right now, but God has not given anything power to fully manifest yet. The foreshadowing has already begun. One day, the partition will be taken down. The protection order, you could say. See, humanity has a protective order. Nothing is to harm humanity from certain places yet. That's going to be dissolved. Things have become very real. And in that moment, if you don't have faith, you don't have anything. If you don't trust in your Lord and Savior, you have no defense. And if you ever wondered why you had to have those spiritual experiences, that was to arm you with something very true. You can't exactly go to a school and learn what you've been learning. Some of you who've had these spiritual encounters, you know how powerless you can become. You know how fearful it can be. You also know that when left alone and then faced with it again, that all that fear comes back. That in order to handle a situation like that, you must be truly prepared for it in truth. Now the whole world is about to face that. That's part of the reason why men's hearts are going to fail them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. See, because some people know the truth. And that truth is not what they want anybody to ever have to. Even the evil people don't want people to face that. How about that? Season of discovery must come. And it begins with the house of God. And that's been happening. Once the children are secure, the world will experience the rest. But the Lord wants you in position first. So haven't you noticed he's been speeding up what you've been exposed to? All situations have been sped up to a degree. So that you become immune to all the nuances of life itself. That you're truly founded in faith. And haven't you noticed that the Lord is requiring us to stand on our faith to make it in, in any given situation? Haven't you noticed that? Because he desires us to have experience with deliverance. He does not want us ignorant concerning his deliverance and his salvation of us. Those things should be very real. So real that you should be able to walk out in the midst of anything that you see trusting in the Lord. Just like Psalm 91. Right? You should be able to behold it. But understand that it will not come near you. But you have to be confident in that saying. And the only way to be confident is that you do everything you can do in line with the truth that God has given you. You have to actually exercise the righteousness God put in you. Because if you can ever sit, stand there and say, well, I didn't do this right, so maybe it'll get to me, then you know better. Don't stand like that. Don't have something undone and use in and, and just simply and leave it undone. Don't do that. Stop leaving things undone. That's something all of us can help each other with. The Bible says, having having done all of what you can do to stand, stand there for. Because if you do everything that God has given you the wisdom to do, you can't go wrong. The problem is, God has given us understanding and wisdom to do things, and we have not done them. And we all know that. Well, I'm telling you, again, it's time to do those things God has given us the understanding to do, the wisdom to do, and the calling to do. It's time for us to do those things that if any even time comes, we can stand in our faith, having no evil conscience, but having a good conscience towards what we have done 
in obedience to the living God. We do not need to stand thinking, well, I left this undone. Oh, I knew I shouldn't have relaxed. No, don't do that. Take this season. Do everything you can do. Do it in honesty. Do it uprightly. Do all of what the Lord has given you understanding to do. Experience his deliverance. Experience his keeping. Experience the strength he'll depart to you. Know those things for real. Those are things you can have right that, that you can know for real. That you can have absolute confidence in. So that when a time comes, you'll already know, I've done everything the Lord has given me to do. And instead of crouching down into a corner in great fear, you'll praise his holy name, even in the middle of a storm.